Okay, how do you feel good today? Feel well? You have to feel good because you are young. <laughs> A lot of promise, especially regarding Korea's diplomacy to the United States. Uh, I'm going to tell you uh, not only the relationship between Korea and the United States, but also covering the entire region of Northeast Asia. Because when I was ambassador to Washington, I had the occasion to talk to U.S. officials and the think tank uh, experts and in the university like you. I addressed many university students. Usually, uh, I was about to talk relationship between uh, the U.S. and China. Will they uh, confront in the end in 21st century? Or will they co-evolve, not necessarily engaging in military confrontation? Well, sometimes when uh, Abe, uh, Prime Minister Abe visited the Yasukuni Shrine and Korea reacted very sternly to this uh, visit, and this made a huge uh, news among Korean experts in Korea, in, in the United States, then they asked me, relationship between Korea and Japan. Sometimes when you have uh, 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 territorial disputes between Korea, Japan, and China, Japan, uh, we only talk about uh, territorial issues. So I have to cover uh, not only bilateral relationship, but also Korea between the United States and China. And many issues came up recently uh, in which Korea is embroiled between the two countries. How do we uh, deal with it? That was the question. And uh, as you know, last year, uh, this year, the almost entire diplomacy of Korea was uh, focusing on North Korean nuclear issue, which is linked to the future of North Korea. So I have to address this issue, this issue as well. And. Uh, one of the important aspects of this region is the U.S., Korea, Japan trilateral cooperation and how this tri cooperation will deal with China. That is an important issue as well. And lastly, uh, there exists a serious issue regarding history between Korea and Japan. And U.S has alliance with these two countries, Korea and Japan. So uh, this becomes a sometimes uh, intense interest for the United States. So how we are going to deal with the, the uh, historic rift between the two countries, how we'll address to, to the United States and other countries, that is last section. So beginning uh, my lecture, I will first focus on the transition from one-dimensional diplomacy to multi-dimensional diplomacy. This is characteristic of Korean uh, diplomacy because, as you may not know yet, but Korea lived with one-dimensional diplomacy for the last six centuries. So suddenly, with the rise of China, we are to face multi-dimensional world in this, uh, on the horizon. So we have to adapt to multilateral diplomacy suddenly, rather suddenly. So we have yet to grasp the essence of this transition from unidimensional to multi-dimensional diplomacy. So that will be the beginning of my lecture today. So what is one-dimensional diplomacy? And what is the characteristics of multidimensional diplomacy? So as you may have guessed, Korea has lived six centuries under one-dimensional diplomacy. So it has a habit to uh, find personal connections rather than national interest and tend to appeal to other countries these days to the United States, rather than 
identifying difference between national interests between two countries, compare them, and make it its own diplomacy. So that is the most daunting task for Korean diplomacy. So let me tell you how Korea lived with one-dimensional diplomacy for the last six centuries. <clears throat> Under the Choson dynasty, which uh, lasted for six, uh, five centuries until to the end of the last uh, 19th century, 20th centuries, we had a tributary relationship with China. What is the essence of tributary relationship? It is quite unlike Western tributary relationship. In the West, strong nation occupy small nation and ask contribution. In East Asian tributary system, China allowed autonomy to tributary nations. So there is no direct interference in internal affairs. But diplomacy was in the hand of China. So except diplomacy, Joseon dynasty enjoyed autonomy. So when it comes to foreign countries, Seoul used to ask Ming dynasty and Qing dynasty later what we are going to do. What do you have to do? That was the question. So five centuries, we had a habit to ask China about Korea's diplomatic relationship. What we are going to do? That question, that answer never entered in our mind. We always ask one country. So that has become, had become one of our habit. So China was Korea's diplomacy in a way. So this phenomenon was eminently uh, described by Chinese diplomat in Tokyo towards the end of 19th century. By 1880, 1880 the, the counselor, Huang Junshen, Chinese diplomat in Beijing, wrote an epoch-making strategy for Korea. Korean strategy. This is the title, Korean strategy, and this is the excerpt. This book is not very long, seven, eight pages, but it contains dramatic change for Korea at the time. Because Korea lived with one-dimensional diplomacy for many millennia, now, with the arrival of the West, in the East, the horizon changed completely. So we had to adapt from Sinocentric world to global world. So we have to expand our horizon, not only on China, but also on the United States, on Japan, and on Russia. That was the obligation for Korean diplomacy at all. So this is the content, and Hwang Jun Shen advised for Korea, it's good to, for us to maintain relationship like brothers. Of course, China was a big brother, Korea is a little brother. We maintain the relationship, but you have to expand your relationship with other countries. So he advised, advised create ties with Japan, and ally itself with the United States. That was his advice. So imagine what happened to the Korean diplomats' mind at the time. So for many centuries, you only relied on China for survive diplomatically. But suddenly, Chinese diplomat advised us, that is not enough. You have to ally yourself with the United States, maintain relationship with Japan, and strengthen yourself. So what do you think happened in Korea at the time? 1991, 1881. When this Korean strategy was introduced to King Gojong at the time, 
he, of course, discussed this, this affair with his, his lieutenants. Then this book went out of the court, and Korean intellectuals read it. And most of them were simply startled, surprised. How can you change it from China-centric world to global world? So they protested to this new strategy. They said, there is no way we can get rid of our dependence on China. So we are not going to make alliance with the United States. We are not going to have relations with Japan because in case something happens with the United States, with Japan, what are you going to do? We don't know how to deal with it. So more than 10,000 Confucian scholars, they made a petition to King Gojong, say that we have to depend on China. We refuse to entertain other perspectives. That was the reaction. So with such a perspective, we could not survive. So we had no perspective to entertain new paradigms from Sino century to the global world. The so conclusion was we fell victim to this inability to entertain new perspective. So, so the conclusion was there was a war between China and Japan. Japan won the war, Sino-Japanese war, and Korea became colony of Japan. So depending on one country brought to the colonization of Korea to Japan. So as you can see, Japan, with Meiji restoration, they became strong militarily. They occupied Korea, went to Manchuria, and part of China, Southeast Asia, then Pacific Islands here. That's how they colonized Korea to expand their uh, territory occupation of other countries. So Korea remained under Japan from four to six decades. So our diplomacy didn't exist at all. Something happened to Korea, we have to ask Japan as well. Then there was a war between Japan and the United States. Japan lost, and afterwards we had inter seen and seen war between South and North Korea. So after the war, we made alliance with the United States. So Korea made alliance with the United States. That is happening actually today. What is the meaning of the alliance and what happened to this relationship? That is the, the uh, content of this course. Korea-U.S. alliance, why uh, Korea may need alliance? For any given country, be it the United States, China, or any country you, you can imagine, your country of origin, you have three options. Neutrality, independence, or alliance. So neutrality, many people in, inside South, South Korea they say neutrality is good for us because nobody will bother us. But that does not happen in history. Neutrality needs a specific uh, geographical, loca geographical location to entertain. Imagine Switzerland and Belgium. Two countries try to maintain neutrality. Switzerland maintained it. The neutrality of Belgium was broken over and over by hegemonic countries. So neutrality is something you cannot pretend, I want to have neutrality. That is not your option. Especially like Korea, which is uh, located in a, in a uh, geographically important position in Northeast Asia. It will be broken by one or other country. Uh, they will break North Korea, uh, South Korea, Korean neutrality for their hegemonies. So it doesn't work, neutrality for South Korea. Switzerland, it works. But Belgium, South Korea, it doesn't work. Independence is a good word. Countries to become independent. But in the world, there are five or six countries which can claim independence. Because in this era of nuclear weapons, 
independence must become strategic independence. You have to have nuclear weapons. So there are the United States, Russia, European Union, China, perhaps India. So even Japan is not a strategically independent country. They won't become it, they have to go nuclear. So independence does not work like a small country like, like South Korea. So the only option remains Korea is to ally with one country. Why the United States? As they say, Korea has four big powers around the Korean Peninsula. Maritime power, it used to be Great Britain, now United States, Japan, Russia, China. Nobody claims that Korea make alliance with Russia. It doesn't work. Ideologically or geographically, no sense at all. So nobody claims that South Korea can maintain alliance with Japan because Japan Korea alliance doesn't work. China alliance with China, sometimes people maintain that would work, but if Korea maintains alliance with China, Korea falls back to territory, to ter tributary relationship with, in the world. Korea will lose diplomacy. So it, it will maintain, restrict Korea's diplomatic maneuvering power. So that doesn't work. So the only way for Korea to uh, maintain its diplomacy is make alliance with remote country like the United States. That's the best option happening in Korea. We had it after the, the end of Korean War from 1959 to 53. So alliance with the United States has a great significance for Korea and we would like to maintain it for our own national interest. It gives us best option for Korea's diplomacy. Unlike any other, neutrality, independence, alliance with China, that would limit Korea's diplomatic horizon. So alliance with the United States is the best option for Korea. <clears throat> so one drawback with alliance with the United States because Korea was very poor, small, and uh, uh, at the end of the uh, colonialism, so we did not know how to survive at the time. So America came with every opportunity to Korea, with especially trade paradigm. Korea tried to uh, develop economic, develop, uh, economic uh, development in Korea. So we embraced the trade paradigm. So Korea also was under the influence of value system, democracy, human rights. America brought it to Korea. And uh, other influences, we observed everything from America for the last 60 years. So it was like a Korea replacing China. Everything happened during that time. We had to go to Washington and ask what we are going to do. So that was lasted until nine, to the end of 20th century. Around 15, 20 years ago, Korea had no diplomacy. We asked Washington and appealed to their sensibility and asked what we are going to do. So for that, in unique dimensional diplomacy, philosophy for diplomacy or your own assessment were not interesting, was not interesting. Personal connections appealing to strong nations were the best options we had under the one-dimensional diplomacy. So even this time, whenever there is a change of government administration in the United States, people ask, who knows whom? What can be our best personal connection? To whom we could appeal? That was predominant phenomenon in Korean press even today. So six centuries, one-dimensional diplomacy still remains in our psychology. But we have to get rid of it because of the rise of China. So rise of China, what is it? Rise of China happens to everybody in this world, even your individual countries, rise of China. But Korea feels it most acutely than any other country because Korea and China re established their diplomatic relations in 1992. 
It was only 26 years ago. What happened in 26 years? Early 1990s, the relationship, the economic relationship was non-existent. There is no person visiting each other. There is no cultural exchanges between each other. So in more than two decades, something happened which startled everybody, especially Korea diplomacy. Look at here. In 20 years, the economic relationship between Korea and China developed exponentially. We have more than $300 billion of trade in 20 years, from nothing to a development which we can have difficulty to, to deal with it. $300 billion is more than Korea's trade with Japan, Korea with the United States combined. Korea's trade with Japan is around $100 billion. Second largest trading partner, Japan. The United States, almost the same, $100 billion. So in 20 years, China has become the most important partner economically. That is not all. We have 10 million people visiting each other recently. From nobody visited each other. 10 million people who export them. We have 850 direct flights between China and Korea weekly. That is twice, more than twice, of the number of weekly flights from Korea and the United States. So in 20 years, but it grows exponentially in the future as well. So imagine that, that seismic change for Korea. Now, our security depends on the United States. The economy depends on China. So this changes everything in Northeast Asia. The rise of China, how to deal with it. It changed the relationship between Korea with China, Korea, United States, but also it created autonomy for North Korea and for Japan as well. So with the rise of China, Japan's voice also rose. So with Japan uh, become independent or more or less uh, uh, raising its voice is not dead for Korea, except we have historic rift with Japan. How to deal with this issue? So it's more than serious than you possibly imagine because it is not mistrust, but it's about distrust. Mistrust is something happens between people, between nations, something you can eliminate with persuasion, with the diplomatic meetings. You can eliminate misfortune. That is not bad. So that is the idea when I served the, the United States, most Americans were asking to Korea and Japan. Mistrust. How can you eliminate this mistrust and get along with each other to import our lives for the United States? So mistrust should be dispelled. But I tell them, American audience, even American officials, this is rather distrust. It's not about mistrust. Distrust is something happening because you have substantial, substantive difference on the issue. It cannot be eliminated by persuasion, by negotiation, by education. It's above, beyond those attempts. So this is a distrust. How to deal with the distrust? That is the question with Japan. So with that aspect, we have to be able to explain our position to Korean people, to the United States, and to the world. So we'll deal with these uh, questions. First of all, Korea between uh, United States and China, and North Korean nuclear issue, the future of North Korea, and trilateral cooperation, the US. Japan, Korea, and China, how to read China, and history rift between Korea and Japan. And North Korea, you know the 
the issue because uh, this year the entire coverage diplomacy was focusing on North Korea nuclear issue and its future. So we'll deal with this issue uh, importantly. First of all, United States and China. As I mentioned, United States is important for Korea's security and China important for Korea's economy. So this is, uh, to exaggerate a little bit, schizophrenic diplomatic difficulty for Korea. How to deal with these two issues? So important thing is you have to balance between the two, security and economy in the United States and Japan. But the important element is here. We have to balance these two important elements, but not balancing two equal items. We have to balance Korea-US alliance and Korea-China cooperation. So this is about balancing alliance and cooperation. So this gives more difficulty for Korea. Let me explain two examples the difficulty we are facing in balancing the US and China. We have uh, uh, TPP AIB, TPP as you know, the Trans-Pacific Partnership involving most Asian countries except China. That was engineered by Japan and the United States under Obama administration and Abe administration, except China, TPP. And AIB, AIB, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, mounted by China and United States, Japan, were opposed to join this initiative. What is Korea going to do? And the imp another important issue touching upon security was Fed, the Fed issue. Terminal high altitude air defense system. This is strategic uh, weapons system. So how to deal with a, a TPP AIB issue? So unfortunately, Korea did not deal, deal it as well because it lacked principle and philosophy. It wanted to remain ambiguous, taking no positions. That was not sufficient for Korea because when it comes to Korea's real interest, you have to make a position based on principle and philosophy. We couldn't do it neither on TPP nor on AIB. What is going to do for Korea and happened in the end, explain here. TPP, AIB is not a strategic issue and it comes with globalization of economy. Now Donald Trump is opposed to globalization, but that was trend, that will be a trend as well. So Korea had to join both institutions. There is no doubt for Korea. As a principle, we have to join those two institutions, economic institutions. So first principle Korea had to entertain was very simple. Korea will join both TPP and AIB, but timing and modality shall be reviewed because America was opposed, China was opposing. So we have to find the right moment to join it. But principle must be announced. Korea will join AIB, TPP, that was the principle. But at the time, tactically, you have to maintain timing and modality shall be reviewed. Had we announced this multi-dimensional position, Korea might have had no difficulty. So Korea didn't have the philosophy, so we waited until the moment when TPP, every country joined, and Korea didn't express its position to join it. Even after every country joined it, Korea tried to join it too late. So in the end, Donald Trump obliterated this initiative, but didn't matter, but Korea was in very difficult position. 
Korea lost opportunity to join the TPP. And AIB, uh, the history is very simple. <clears throat> As China's economy rising, China tried to join its voice by investing more in the World Bank. The United States opposed it. The United States monopolized the organization in a way and appointed the director general of the World Bank. It's Washington who nominates effectively the director of World Bank. But if China invests more and China's voice rises, Washington will lose this power. It cannot control World Bank. It was the same with Asia Development Bank. ADB is controlled by Japan. And China tried to invest more in the, in the ADB. Japan opposed it because now Japan appoints a director ADB every time. But if Japan loses this power, ADB will be in the hand of China rather than Japan. So America and Japan opposed Chinese initiative to increase more join the institution, the paradigm was refused. So what you are going to do? Any idea? You have enough fund, but cannot be used in the established institutions. Naturally, you create a new one. That was AIIB. So with huge financing, China launched AIIB. What is your position? This is economic institution for globalization. So Korea should have taken the same attitude. Korea will join AIB, but the modality could be reviewed. Timing modality could be reviewed because the United States was opposing so strongly. But Korea didn't make this position, multi-dimensional position, just to wait it, wait it without taking any, any position. That has been called a strategic ambiguity. That was Korea's inability to deal with multi-dimensional diplomacy at the time. So strategic ambiguity, doing nothing, we waited until London joined AIB. Then he joined AIB because the United States could not oppose Korea joining AIB after London joined AIB. So we lost all the opportunity. Taking position to China, so we'll join it. Showing interest, America's position, modality and timing will be reviewed. We lost the principle. So these two questions remain difficult for Korea because we did not know how to deal with the new diplomatic horizon, multidimensional diplomacy. Then let's go to the most serious problem happening to Korea diplomacy these days, the third issue. The third was in a way necessary for Korea's defense against North Korea. So is Korean sovereignty to deploy or not in, co in coordination with the United States? So Korea must have taken the position that the third deployment is a matter to be decided between ROK and the United States. It's a sovereign issue for South Korean diplomacy, defense. But China was opposing very strongly to the deployment of a third issue. So this issue must be entertained somehow. How to deal with it? To attach, but Chinese concerns will be reviewed from a technical point of view. So that might have been Korea's position from the beginning. Principled philosophical position based on multi-dimensional diplomacy. So regarding that, the deployment of that is a matter, of, matter to be decided between the ROK and the US. Both Chinese concerns will be reviewed from a technical point of view. 
That means the technical position between China and the U.S. must be left between the two countries. In other words, whenever the U.S. asks us to deploy that, you have to go back to the United States. Have you taken care of the China's technical position regarding their deployment? So the ball goes back to the United States. So as long as the United States comes to us back again, that concern is taken care of. So let's deploy that. So we have to wait such a position. But tragically enough, we took initiative to deploy that. So the first principle of credit diplomacy between the US and China, there is a conflicting problem between the countries. We have to wait for the countries, China and the US, deal with this issue first, and we take this position. But we never take initiative to make it our own problem. Why? Was it difficult? This is the sad uh, characteristics. I'd like to pay attention here. The forward-based radar, which means they call X-radar. The Fed deployed in on South Korea could maintain against North Korea, not in the, in the position regarding Seoul, the third terminal defense system, they cannot attack any missiles coming to Seoul. That is too late to, to, uh, to limit off to the launch, attack launch. So that could maintain South Korea, the missiles coming to, to the south, or southern part of South Korea, Busan or Daejeon area, not in the north. That was one characteristic we have to take care of. But most importantly, X-ray the system. X-ray the system does not concern at all South Korea. It is typical no matter between the US and China. X-ray the system, once deployed here, that can maintain all the missile launch problems in China, this area. So China has legitimate problem to set the deployment on South Korea. So that is why China. China complained to South Korea that we have to be careful about their deployment because it concerns us. So in a way, you have to maintain two axes with, with, with their deployment. One is south-north axis, which is taken care of. We, we maintained only south-north axis in Korean diplomacy didn't matter other aspect. But there is the US-China axis, X-ray the issue. But again, South Korea completely ignored the second axis, the US-China. We said China should not be concerned. Why Korea has such a position? That is not Korean issue, uh, Korean uh, weapons. Once deployed, Korea has nothing to do with the Fed. It's maintained completely by America and maintained by America, they monopolize everything about that. We cannot even approach that launch pad. So because of this is a strategic weapon and characteristics are not known to Korea. Why Korea maintained for more than one year that does not concern China? It's a unidimensional approach. We only concern one country. But surprisingly, uh, White House spokesman acknowledged it in press briefing, said, we understand China's concern to their deployment in Korea. We understand China's concern because America knew the effect of X-ray on China. But we ignored it. We deployed it, it took initiative to deploy it, but ignored it. Such a crucial mistake we made regarding their deployment. 
It might have been better if the United States pressed Korea for deployment, saying that without deployment, there will be no military alliance. Then we might have deployed it. So we explained to everybody it was U.S. initiative. But we did it, took initiative. We cannot explain to China. So you have to pay the price. These are the three no's we promised to China, in a way, on sovereign promises. You, the, the contents of these three things, we could do it without making injury to our sovereignty. But that's one thing, it's quite another to promise it to another country that is unsovereign diplomacy. We promised the three things. There'll be no additional Fed launchers. We promised it to China. We can maintain such a position for our own interest, that's good, but promised to China. And not to join a regional missile defense system with the United States and Japan, because the United States and Japan, they maintain radar system jointly, but they're asking Korea to join this bilateral radar system. We had difficulties to join this issue for many reasons, for our own national interest. That's good to have such a position, but why promise it to a third country, China? That is unsovereign promise to a third country. The third, most curiously, is not to join a trilateral military alliance with the United States Japan. That concerns with only China. Then maybe the position, taking into anything, everything into account, Korea's position well thought about. But maintaining it as a Korea's position is OK. But promising it to a third country is quite another matter. We promised it China. So by failing to deal with the relationship between alliance, alliance with the United States, cooperating with China, we failed it. We paid this price. It remains with us still. So this is about the balancing Korea diplomacy between the US and China. And let's go to the next question, which uh, you uh, should be familiar with. The old newspaper, national, international, we're talking about North Korea nuclear issue. So what is the essence of this issue? What are the diplomatic characteristics of this issue? We'll review now. To begin with, nuclear issue is a standalone issue. It is linked with the future of North Korea. In other words, you cannot try to resolve, resolve North Korea nuclear issue because the future of North Korea is linked to North Korea nuclear issue, so you have to deal with both issues at the same time. The survival of North Korea is linked to development of nuclear weapons by North Korea. So survival, nuclear weapons, should be dealt with at the same time, two issues at the same time. So problem which happened until time, and now, we focused on nuclear issues only, and that will never happen. The solution will never happen in North Korea because survival is the key, non nuclear weapons for North Korea. And North Korean nuclear issue is linked to survival. Survival is a, represents a deep dilemma for North Korea because North Korea is trying to develop nuclear weapons and economic development at the same time. Nuclear weapons, economic development, which is called by them as a Pyongjin line. Simultaneous pursuit of weapons, nuclear weapons, economic development. My question to you, would it work? A country of a medium size, like South Korea, North Korea, can develop nuclear weapons, achieve nuclear development at the same time? So Pyongjin line is more like a slogan than it's a policy for any country. 
So it did happen because North Korea realized at the time the importance of economic development for its own survival. His father, Kim Jong-un's father, was Kim Jong-il. He had national policy, which is military first policy only, to survive. He has to invest everything on military, weaponization of nuclear and other military capabilities that would support his survival. So military first policy. But when Kim Jong-un came to power, he realized military first will not support his own survival. He has to focus on economy as well. So that is how he changed from military first policy to simultaneous pursuit, Pyongyang line, economy, and nuclear weapons. Why it will not work for North Korea? Because South Korea's case tells you clearly that it cannot happen. In 1978, 1978 President Carter tried to withdraw Korean, uh, American troops from South Korea. So President Park Jong hee at the time said, in the case, we have to develop nuclear weapons. Because without American troops, we have to have nuclear weapons to face North Korean aggression. So that was a rational decision. But America knew that Korea was bent on nuclear development. They came back to Korea with a stern choice. Nuclear weapons, economic development. You cannot have it both ways. Make a choice. At the time, South Korea was uh, in hot pursuit for economic development. It cannot abandon economic development. With this, Korea cannot survive. With this, the regime, Park Jong-un regime, could not survive. So the choice was very simple. Korea had to abandon nuclear weapons very, very easily. OK, no more nuclear weapons. We will focus on economic development. Because at the time, if you maintain, like North Korea, simultaneous pursuit, South Korea will become like North Korea. There will be no more export, no more trade. An autarkic economy has come to South Korea. So it was very simple. The same is true for North Korea. North Korea cannot have it both ways. Nuclear weapons and economic development cannot happen to North Korea, as it was the case to South Korea. And the problem is <coughs> North Korean dilemma, the nature of North Korea's future. If North Korea focuses on economic development, will it work like South Korea? Do you think it will happen in North Korea? Abandoning nuclear weapons and focusing on new, uh, uh, economic development, will it work now like South Korea? What do you think? Suppose that, as many people last year, this year, imagined, Kim Jong-un decided to demolish all nuclear weapons. And he will be focusing on economic development. Will it work? May or may not. Because North Korean regime is supported by complete control of the population. Economic development, to realize it, you must give a freedom to your own citizen. So if you give a freedom to your own citizen, the controlling of the society cannot continue. So regime may collapse because of economic development. So that is a critical dilemma for North Korea. So you cannot abandon nuclear weapons. It cannot opt for economic development. It does not know what to do. So this is a deep mortal dilemma for North Korea. How to choose between the two, nuclear weapons or economic development? So this dilemma, nobody can solve it except North Korea. 
So we have to manage the situation, how North Korea will deal with this issue, this issue, rather than assuming that we have a proposal to North Korea, you abandon nuclear weapons, and economic development will give you every, every opportunity. This proposal we cannot make North Korea because they have, it has its own dilemma against nuclear development, uh, economic development course as, a, as the sole purpose of the nation. So the dilemma uh, must be in your mind when you deal with North Korea's future. So currently, uh, do you have the text with you in your computer? So you can see it. North Korea has around 15 nuclear weapons according to institution of the United States. We do not know the numbers. Rough idea is North Korea does have tens of nuclear weapons. Some say they have 15, some say 60. We do not know. Tens of nuclear weapons, North Korea does have it. So how to deal with it? There are not many. The, the POM-5, POM-5 means America, Russia, China, France, Great Britain. Then you have three countries, four, including Israel, Pakistan, India, Israel, and North Korea. So there are, there are many. But North Korean nuclear issue is critical because you cannot accept North Korean nuclear weapons, unlike any other country. So sanctions are imposed on North Korea because we do not accept North Korea as a nuclear weapon state. So currently, <clears throat> there are around 7,000 U.S. and Russia in three parts, stockpiled, strategic deployment, one-third, and one-third retired. Huge economic burden to these two countries. Curiously enough, I'll come back to this issue, look at China. China, less than 300. It does not have retired, it does not have stockpiled. It has only 300 nuclear weapons. So this issue should come back when I explain the China's strategy for 21st century. A very important issue. U.S., Russia, and China is here. Now, nuclear uh, weapons become a critical issue for our two countries. This year, South Korea, DPRK, and the U.S., they've dealt with this issue crucially. You have Pyongyang Joint Declaration of September. We had many precursor encounters, but this was the final product of South Korea and North Korea. Overall, uh, this is rather a sort of a declaration. We will do it. We we'll propose to this. There is no seriously any concrete measure regarding denuclearization of North Korea. So first of all, the important thing is here. We will develop economic relation between South and North Korea, but here, as conditions ripe, why this insertion is necessary as a condition ripe? South and North Korea to leaders met and they promised we'll develop economic cooperation between the countries, but there is a condition, as conditions ripe. Why? It is necessary. Any idea? Because of economic sanctions by the United Nations Security Council. Sanctions are there. Because sanctions 
are not abandoned, you cannot make economic cooperation. So sanctions are there here. We have to take care of nuclear sanctions. And nuclear weapons, there is only one uh, mentioned in the declaration. That's the fifth, the last. The Korean Peninsula must be turned into a land of peace free from nuclear weapons. Korean Peninsula, denuclearization, that is only mention any concrete measures there. So this is where we are, South North Korea. There is a lot of promises, but except military uh, detente between the two, economic development, the real uh, future development are yet to wait, waiting for relaxation of economic sanctions. The Singapore summit happened uh, uh, three months prior to Pyongyang summit. Something very important happened. Something very important happened. As you know, the contents is rather not satisfying. It's like Pyongyang declaration, general principle, we'll do it, we'll do it, promise for the future. But something happened before and after the summit that became crucial for North Korean nuclear issue. Here, you can see it. North Korea dismantled nuclear test site in May, one month prior to Singapore summit. Destroyed nuclear test site. And several days prior to, before the summit, missile test facility destruction. So in preparation for Singapore summit, Kim Jong-un decided to destroy nuclear test site and missile launching site. Why did he do it? That was the uh, incentives for Donald Trump to come to Singapore, make a deal with Kim Jong-un. As you remember, today is 29th of November 2018. Exactly one year earlier, 29th of November 2017, something happened in North Korea. Anybody remember? One year ago, on that day, Kim Jong-un launched ICBM, Hwasong-15, for the first time. ICBM means interballistic missile, which can reach North Korea, North America, succeeded in it. ICBM went very well. So he declared, after launching of ICBM, missile, he, he said publicly the completion of North Korean nuclear weapons, both nuclear weapons and missiles. Completion. Pay attention to this. One year ago, Kim Jong decided North Korean nuclear weapons are completed. If you accept completion, that means you don't need any more testing. Neither nuclear, no missile. Completion means no more testing. So that was crucial for something happens afterwards. One year ago, completion of North Korean nuclear weapons declared publicly for, by Kim Jong-un. Then he had, web, he had diplomatic tools to induce South Korea, to induce the United States, to induce China for summit meetings. I will destroy future testing facilities, both nuclear and missile. So he did it. And we do not know what happened between bilateral meeting between Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump, but what happened afterwards in his joint, in his press briefing, press briefing, it is not in the 
some meeting joint communique, he said, I will suspend South Korea-US military exercise, joint military exercise. So that was the key between North Korea and the United States. North Korea suspend testing, United States suspend joint military exercise between US and South Korea against North Korea. That was simultaneous suspension, suspension between the, the countries. Exactly how China wanted to, from the beginning, for many years, simultaneous suspicion is the first, sus suspension is the first objective regarding the North Korean nuclear question. So I presume the mutual suspension, suspension was the subject, major subject, what happened between North Korea and Xi Jinping when they met prior, prior to Singapore summit meeting. So joint suspicion was the key. We are still there. After suspension, in other words, we succeeded in relaxation of tensions. Remember what happened last year. Remember the war of wars between Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump. They tried to kill each other. Kim Jong-un tried to, to set missiles around Guam facility, which is American territory. And Donald Trump said, our much more powerful arms and locked, fired locked. So very, very dangerous situation. But now with the simultaneous suspension, it's gone. But after suspension, the real problem is denuclearization. Even though Kim Jong-un suspended the future test, what we actually have as a nuclear weapons facility still remain. He does have tens of nuclear weapons. He does have medium missiles, many places in North Korea, which cover entire South Korea, entire Japan, and major part of China. They are under the realm of North Korean nuclear attack. So how to deal with this issue? It doesn't work at all. Why? Because Donald Trump says, I want to protect North America. He did it in Singapore. Afterwards, he said many times, I do not care how many times it takes for the denuclearization of North Korea. He doesn't care because it affects regional countries, not America, South Korea, Japan, and China. So for this, America maintains solution approach. America proposed CVID, now PPVD. In other words, complete verifiable denuclearization. That was the key of North Korea, uh, United States. That was the objective and proposed already. Unless North Korea joins this proposition, there will be no negotiation. But this does not work for North Korea because North Korea's survival instinct will not allow North Korea to present everything for America to the complete verifiable denuclearization. It doesn't work for North Korea. On the other hand, North Korea also has made a mistake because North Korea tried to say that to America, I destroyed for you testing site, nuclear weapons test facilities. And this is the beginning of denuclearization. I want you to relax economic sanctions. So we have two different objectives, positions, which does not coincide very much. So we are stuck there. After Singapore nuclear uh, summit meeting, which produced, uh, in a way, simultaneous suspension, then regarding denuclearization, we are stuck between the position. North Korea want to relaxation of sanctions. America want North Korea to beginning the real denuclearization. And to my mind, 
it will take a lot of time or a lot of unexpected event to make those countries to move each other. So that is the problem, and we are stuck here. Many people say that uh, something uh, Donald Trump will make decision regarding the uh, relaxation of tension, something Kim Jong-un make a, a position regarding uh, completely very verifiable the nuclearization, that is not something we can happen by persuasion, by appeal, it's, it's beyond those domain. It touch upon the survival of North Korea, touch upon America's basic approach to uh, the nuclearization of North Korea. So we are still here. That is uh, uh, how you pass several months at least. And next year, we'll see what will happen on this front. But the coincidence, the problem uh, of rapprochement between America and North Korea is very, very meager. So, I explained the, uh, several elements. First of all, unidimensional to multidimensional diplomacy, and uh, uh, Korea between the United States alliance and Chinese cooperation where we are. Now we touched upon North Korean nuclear issues. But after break, if you will, we'll enter to discuss the future of North Korea, which is linked to North Korean nuclear issue. Okay? So I'll see you 15 minutes break. <laughs>